Okay, we're, we're going to go ahead and get started. So if everybody wants to grab a seat. Um, just a few like housekeeping issues. If you didn't sign in and you would like to get copies of the presentations, please be sure that you sign in and give us your email address so that I can mail those to you afterwards. We're going to have two presentations this evening. One is on the um, proposed bond election projects, and the second one is on the budget. So after the presentation, or even during, if you have questions, just raise your hand and staff will be able to help you. Um, now I'd like to ask Councilmember Crane to come up and open the meeting, and then we'll get started. We're talking, we're live. Yeah, we're recording it for people who couldn't attend tonight, so. So I've got to speak in this. I'm, I'm pretty loud by myself, but I'll just try and tone it down a little bit. Hey, thanks for coming out tonight. I know you all have lots of other things you could do on a Wednesday night, and I'm, I've been getting a lot of questions about what's coming up in the bond, what's coming up in the budget, so I thought it best just to host something like this where you can get your questions answered, and we can do it all at one time. I was, as I was talking to some of you, I, didn't, I don't really have prepared remarks, but what I'll say, I'll tell you a little bit um, about where I'm spending my time right now. Um, if you haven't met Katie Wary, where did she go? Right there. Katie's my district director who keeps um, my calendar and slaps my hand at this point now when I start trying to do something with it. But I wake up every morning and it's filled with meetings and things I'm supposed to be doing and, and where I'm supposed to be. But a couple of highlights, I'll tell you what um, I've been doing. One is, if you didn't hear about the Rivian deal, um, that's a potential $5 billion deal that will be out on the Walsh Ranch property. Um, it's 2,000 acres they're looking at. It, it's, Rivian is probably Tesla's biggest competitor. It'll create at least 7,500 jobs uh, and uh, good paying jobs at least $56,000. So with that, I also know with all the growth out there, I've been talking to basically every single ranch uh, or their representative on the everything outside 820. Um, there's going to be a lot of growth. The growth in the last five to ten years have been, has been up north, and the new census numbers show that. The growth in the next five to ten years is going to be 820 west because we have so much land out there. It, it, we are already working, and Gary Hogan's been working with me for a long period of time, of talking to the, the entities that have oversight for what that traffic and the traffic management will look like. I don't want to have the same problems they have up north uh, that they've been looking at and should have planned it out. So uh, one thing I'm trying to do is get all the ranches in, in the room together so we can master plan this out. I've also been talking to TxDOT and to the uh, uh, regional uh, RTC. Uh, I now sit on the executive board of the uh, North Texas Commission um, where we're looking at all those issues and problems. And I just had a phone call yesterday to talk about that from someone from there, just making sure it's on their radar. The other thing as you come in that I've been working on is the Las Vegas Trail. This was something that Councilman Bird had started. I don't think anybody had really looked at it for a long period of time. My aunt lived there in the 80s uh, when it was you know, a great place to be. Um, but then it sort of got for, uh, forgotten about. And there's a lot of crime and drugs and other things in the area. So one thing we've done, as you know, we, we purchased, the city purchased the, uh, the uh, YMCA that was there. They were underwater wanting to get out. It could have gone and sold to somebody and been more apartments. We bought it, turned it into a community center for everyone, and it's run by LBT Rise. Um, we've also sat down and started talking with uh, uh, some folks, a uh, public-private partnership, to reimagine Las Vegas Trail and what that looks like. Um, there's some developers that have bought property north of 30. I asked them to start coming south. Um, looking at the eyes of what I'd love to see there is, I've used this a lot, some debulking of those apartments. That might mean tearing some of them down. It also might mean turning some of them into condos so people can own them, develop the neighborhood, and have some affordable, attainable housing for them in that area. So that's something we've just gotten started that we uh, will, on Tuesday, um, approve a, an RFP, RFQ, to hire a third party that will put together a transformational plan, is what we're calling it, that will be due, due next April or May as part of the process, which will then allow us to go after federal funds uh, to acquire, to help just reimagine what that looks like. Um, just for context, and you probably know it, anybody that lives close or around, 1% uh, of the population lives in the Las Vegas Trail area, but 4% of the crime in the, in the city of Fort Worth comes from that area. So it is an, an unbalanced, you know, our police officers are uh, really taxed in what they do. Um, their resources could be better served other places and other areas, and I know a lot of y'all uh, talk to me about that too, of crime, some things that's, that are happening in your neighborhoods. 
but we've got to attack that problem before it becomes worse. So that's what I'm committed to do. And then on a daily basis, uh, we're just addressing, answering calls and making sure things are handled. So please, y'all keep contacting us when you see things and trying to make the city better. And with that, I want to turn this over. We're going to talk, I think, about the bond first. Is that right, Michelle? We'll talk about the bond and then the budget itself. If y'all have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. If you have questions that we're going along, just wave your hand and um, we'll get those answered. But I appreciate it. Yeah, already. So we, uh, and David might be better suited to answer this question, but it's about 440 million, right? But it's tied to them actually performing and creating the jobs that they created. We've heard that before. Yeah. And it never works. Yeah. I can't, I can't promise for what was before or what happened before, before, but happy to talk with you about it. Yeah. It's, it's in, the incentives we're giving them are tied to real jobs and real things being created. If they don't hit those marks, then they don't get the tax rebates. Yeah, that, that happened with, with Tandy and also with Cabela's and it goes on and on. They make a lot of promises. But you all never enforce them. Well, I can say I'm going to enforce it, and our city manager is going to enforce it. They, it. It's tied to real numbers. If they don't hit those with the jobs, then they won't get the tax rebates. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Okay. On the same subject, uh, will they be hiring from within Texas, or will they be bringing in their own people from out of state? So what we've heard, and David, David told me I'm wrong, that they, there will be a, a, a large portion of them hired from here. So they're, they're going to create jobs here in Texas. They have a very small factor, I think, right now in normal, but it won't be enough to, for the capacity here. Well, with Abbott and Price always bringing in people from out of town, out of state, then our voting is screwed. So I was just wondering if we're going to be bringing in people from the north or people that don't see our values. Uh, I, I think, they're again, they're going to create the jobs here. And that's our hope as part of this. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, Roger, do you want to, are you talking about the bond for, yep, awesome. He'll get on me if I don't put this mic up here, so. Uh, anyway, my name's Roger Venables, and I'm with the Aviation Department, but I'm going to present to you tonight the proposed 2022 bond program, okay? Um, I was involved in the 2018, I got transferred over to aviation here not long ago, but I was involved in the 2022 in, in its creation, so I wanted to stay on board. I like bond programs. I think they're they're very interesting, and so hopefully you find this interesting tonight, and we can get some good feedback on what we present to you. All right, Michelle, don't let me mess this up again. Is that it? Great. Well, first, we'll start off with some program goals. So we have to have some objectives when we start to any type of program like this. So we looked at some major program goals, if you will. We won. We wanted to maintain and improve our existing infrastructure and address equity throughout the city. We want to provide mobility and city services, particularly in those growth areas. We want to enhance our active transportation, our recreational corridors, and allow for some flexibility and partnership opportunities. What you're going to see in this bond program represents some of those partnership opportunities, for instance, with Tarrant County. We're trying to partner with Tarrant County as a part of their bond program in November that we can partner up on some of our mutual projects of interest, um, and then achieve balance in fiscal stewardship. So what that really means is if we build something, we know we're going to have to keep the lights on now, probably going to have to staff it up. There's going to be additional operating costs to the city in future years when that project gets delivered. So if it's a new community center, we know we're going to have ongoing operating and maintenance costs with it. So we try to balance that and recognize that as we're starting to develop the bond program, if we have a new facility, that's recognize that first year O&M when that budget year hits and no going forward, we have those continued expenses. So looking at the strategy, you know, capital delivery, particularly in a fast growing community like this, we're, we're chasing it a lot. We're chasing growth a lot. We're trying to get the infrastructure in place that supports that growth. We've dedicated at $29.8 million to that endeavor to go out and look at arterials in those streets that we know we're going to need expansion. We know we need to develop plans for. Let's go ahead and start that process now. Let's get these plans to at least 60% design by the time we get to the bond program. 
and in some instances be able to reach out to those adjoining property owners that we need right away from and perhaps secure some of that right away in advance. This not only helps us get the right away faster because that can be a timely endeavor to go out and, and, and secure those property rights, but we also have to worry about the public franchised utilities like Encore being able to move their utilities out of the way and they do that on their own. The right of way, utilities, all that has to take place before we can even start our project. So resources, we're reserving some debt capacity. So we've got a program, a $500 million bond program. Now we can afford more capacity, but we need to reserve some capacity in there for emergencies or things that fall out of the bond program, things that are unanticipated. Maybe we've got grant match opportunities that come up that we're not aware of right now but might present themselves once the bond program, the five-year CIP, is developed. So looking at some of the program highlights, when we got put the bond program together, we said there's some things that just jump off the page at us. So about $213 million in leverage opportunities from partnerships with Tarrant County or other outside funding sources. We had $229 million of identified transportation infrastructure, parks, community facilities that are located in our majority minority areas, okay? And I'll talk about that in just a moment. About $100 million in park improvements and open space conservation. So these are just some basic highlights, but we'll see those as we go through the program. So looking at recommended tax allocation, and on the budget presentation, they're gonna go into a little bit more detail about this, but the overall tax rate being proposed for 2022 right now is, is about 73.25 cents per $100 of property value. This is on the ad valorem tax. A portion of that is split up between operations and maintenance, and then a portion of it is carved out to handle our debt, right? So bond programs, for instance, or tax notes, or any type of debt instrument that we've got like that, that 14.75 cents is dedicated to retire that debt. The other portion of operating and maintenance is broken up to operating and capital. Like I said, we know we have, we have properties that we need to take care of. We have roads that need to be maintained. So we're taking a portion of that capital, that six and a half cents, and we're dedicating that to ongoing maintenance, capital maintenance, trying to extend the life of the asset, let's extend the life of the road, let's extend the life of the facility, manage it all the way through its life cycle, and that's paid through cash, whereas debt is paid through debt financing, like the bond program. And generally that's for big ticket items, you know, for building new facilities or replacing existing facilities. So what's, what goes into the project development? Well, really they're born over time, you know, if you think about the data that we collect and the analysis that we have to do on each one of our roads, on each one of our facilities, like measuring the condition of that facility or measuring the con pavement condition, understand where it is in its life cycle, when does it need to be replaced, and prioritizing that. That's an ongoing thing. That's 365 days a year. Master plan and strategic goals. So there are guidance documents out there. So when we form a master plan, we're forming a master plan that says, okay, we're gonna have facilities that are gonna go in here. We have a five-year plan that says, okay, we wanna put a new community center in, or if we wanna put, replace a road. It's a guidance document. It's flexible, but at least it puts some framework around, and I think that's what Councilman Crane was talking about. It puts a framework about development. So we look at development activity. What development activity has occurred out there that's driving the need for some of those services? that we need to deliver. City Council may have projects. Waitlisted projects, we had a project from 2018 that didn't make it on the bond program. It was just slightly below in the prioritization. It still needs to be replaced. So we, sometimes you have waitlisted projects that we have to wait till the next bond cycle to do it. Service demand, again, back to where the demand exists. You know, in the high growth areas, there's always a need for service demands, whether it's police, fire, uh, or roads or transportation. Public meetings, boards and commissions, neighborhood meetings. So all these things kind of factor in play over time. So we talk about the selection process, in particular a bond. So we start out with department develops their projects. So we ask departments to prioritize and rank their projects because they know where their, where their greatest needs are. And so Put those in writing, justify those, and present them to what is a committee, and it's the Project Prioritization Committee, and is a representative of departments 
within the city that is kind of the first filtering process, if you will, to review all those projects that are submitted by each one of the departments. Then it goes to management review for input. So the committee has some recommendations after we've got through prioritizing and ranking the project. We'll take it to the city manager and we'll say, here's, here's some recommendations. It goes through a, another filtering process, always asking questions, always wanting more data, more analysis. Then it goes to city council review and input. City council will take a look at it, might tweak it a little bit, and then they'll say, let's go out and do some public engagement, and let's inform the public of what's proposed for, for the next bond cycle. So we start off, the committee does, with some, what do we call, overarching prioritization criteria. Some of the departments will have these criteria along with others. If you think about TPW, well, they're looking at a PCI. They're looking at the pavement condition index. Again, they're trying to prioritize. They're looking at congestion. They're looking at traffic accidents. They're looking at other metrics, too, in, a, in addition to this. But when you look at all the projects across the spectrum, whether it's a facility, a park, or a street, you're kind of using these general criteria to do that. So I'll touch on equity in just a moment, but service deficiencies, again, does the project address any service deficiencies, particularly in those growth areas? So we ask those questions. Is there leverage opportunities? Is there an opportunity to partner or leverage with outside agencies, like we're planning on doing with Tarrant County? Is it part of an approved master plan? So does the department have an approved master plan that says this is a, faci this is a facility that's called for in our master plan? Is it a capital replacement? Do we have a facility that's well beyond its useful life and it just needs to be replaced? Does it collaborate with other departments? So if you've got multiple departments that want to achieve similar objectives but can do it in the same facility, that's, a, that, that's good. That's a good thing. That, that reduces our, our overall footprint, if you will, and we're still able to divide those, uh, provide those uh, services. Is there a federal, state, or legal requirement? So sometimes there's mandates that are pushed on to municipalities that say, hey, or we might have a contract with somebody that says, hey, you need to put this on your bond program. We need to fund it. We don't have another way to do it. Does it address public health and safety? Does it help reduce or eliminate some environmental concerns? Economic development. Does the project stimulate growth right? um, directly? So if we make an investment there, we know there's job creation and there's growth that can take place. So equity. This is a new criteria that we put in for 2022. And this came right out of the Task Force of Race and Culture. One thing that we wanted to do was ask the question that is the project located within adjacent to or serve a super majority minority area, and that's a minority population of 75% or greater, or a majority minority area, which is a minority population of 50% or more. And you can see where we've got these mapped out through the city, where those MMAs and SMMAs, and that's a, that's a mouthful, so I'll probably stumble on that one a little bit, um, but that's where they're at. But what was submitted? When, it, when all the departments submitted their projects, we had about $1.3 billion worth of projects. Now, obviously, we can't fund all those projects, so we go through that prioritization process that I just described to you. And as you can see, which is not atypical, streets and mobility usually represents the lion's share, okay? Um, that was about $677 million presented, about 53%. Facilities was about 28% at $364 million. Parks, non-vertical. When I have non-vertical in their parks, sometimes operates facilities that, you know, like community centers, for instance. We're just talking about, in this category, park development. So when you think of uh, open space or swing sets or other things like that that you'd see in neighborhood parks or even in community parks. And then open space conservation is a new category for 2022, and we'll describe that here in just a moment. So where did we end up once we got through prioritizing all these projects and ranking them, here's where we ended up with about 64% allocated, being proposed allocated for streets and pedestrian mobility. Parks and recreation, about 17%. Public library, so we're proposing a new public library in the far northwest. Fire safety improvements, we're proposing as two, two fire station replacements. A police facility, new police facility. Two community centers. And then, of course, open space conservation, bringing it up the rear at 3%. So streets and pedestrian mobility. If this map anything, just to 
just gives you some visual perspective of where these projects are planned for intersections, arterials, corridors, and neighborhood streets. So we took the SMMAs and the MMAs and we laid them over that, okay, those majority minority areas to see where they ended up. Well, about $167 million or 69% of that funding category will be located within those majority minority areas. So these are the buckets. These are the project types, okay? So there's some in here like bicycle facilities, for instance, at $6 million. What that means is that's just $6 million that we're gonna find. We have identified need for $6 million worth of projects to address bicycle facilities or neighborhood and school safety, $6 million. We know how to pri where we're gonna prioritize those needs, particularly for school, in front of schools, so for neighborhood safety or safe routes to school. But starting at the top, arterials, the ones highlighted in red font are ones that we're seeking participation with with Tarrant County as a part of their bond program for in November. So there are 11 arterials, so we'd be looking at about a 50-50 split. So we would propose $110 million worth of city funds as part of the bond, leverage that with $149 million from Tarrant County, and an additional $49 million that we've collected for uh, either through impact fee or future improvement agreements from, de uh, from developers, to come to total project cost of $308 million. So you can see that $110 million we're trying to leverage to put $308 million of arterial projects on the ground. So if we travel down the page a little bit, $16.4 million from Tarrant County for intersection projects, traffic signals $4.5 million, and then a grade separated railroad crossing at Everment, 30 million. Bottom line, about $200 million is what we've seek participation from Tarrant County in. We won't know until here probably the next week or two which ones they're gonna say, yes, we'll participate, and no, we won't participate, okay? But right now, this is the proposal that we have on, on the table in front of them. So if you look down at the very bottom on the 2022 bond funds, that's 317 million. We're trying to leverage with outside funding sources to put $570 million of improvements on the ground. And as you can see, without Tarrant County or some participation from outside sources, we couldn't do all these projects. So in partnership, we can do more. So proposed arterials. These are the 11 arterials that are being proposed. I'll let your eyes rest on those just a moment. And you can tell, like for District 7, look, that's a high growth area up there. We're trying to, we're trying to catch up with the capacity needs and all those arterials up there. Um, it is extremely congested. And again, we're seeing a lot of arterial need, if you will, in the north part of town. Established corridors that are supporting transit. So we've got $10 million programmed in for East Lancaster between Jones and Hanley Drive. That $10 million is, set aside, is what we're proposing we could use for local match to support any tr type of transit initiatives. The same would hold true for Eastbury and McCart. Even those are only design dollars, there may be an opportunity, even with some of those design dollars, to secure some right away. Again, the goal being if we know we're going to be doing something and we need additional right away, let's get it now, if we can, because uh, it only gets more expensive in the future. So these are the proposed intersection projects. So I believe there's three that would be located in Council District 3. Uh, Camp Billy at Brian Irvin, Camp Billy at Horn, and Brian Irvin at Oakmont. And really those are all designed to alleviate congestion and safety enhancements. I think some of you already have the list, if I failed to mention this, there's a list out front if you don't, kind of a large eight and a half by 14, that gives you uh, the, the laundry list, if you will, of projects that are being proposed for the bond program. So safety and mobility, our vision zero objective here. We've got high injury networks. So these are where we've got related fatalities and severe injuries. We know where those are. There's about 10 of them that are the highest needs throughout the city, where we see the highest amount of fatalities. Vision zero is just what the name implies what improvements can be made to those corridors to eliminate 
traffic fatalities, not only from vehicular, but pedestrian as well and bicycle, so all modes of transportation. And these are the 10. These are the 10 areas, the corridor Miller Avenue here, the limits from Eastland to Killian. And it just goes across the board, shows you crashes per mile, whether it's located in a supermajority minority area. All but one of those is located in a supermajority minority area. <clears throat> so park and rec. So this is the next big category, if you will. Talk about streets and mobility. On to park and rec. On the left, your left is the, uh, the project types throughout the city. You can see the map, we're just highlighting where the disbursement of those projects are, and I'll go over in a little bit more detail about specific projects that those represent. This is where they're located at in relationship to the majority-minority areas. So again, here's the project buckets on the left. We got the council district, then the project type, or what the project is, the 2022 bond funds, and then of course any partnership opportunities that have come forward as, as either a match or contribution to those projects. So we're taking, asking for about 85 million uh, to get about $100 million worth of project improvements on the ground. The one on the far right, as I mentioned earlier, about operating and maintenance cost, that is our anticipated first year operating expenses when we think the project will be delivered, okay? So we know we're gonna have to include that in that budget year. So, Botanic Garden infrastructure improvements. Okay, we turned over the management of the Botanic Gardens to uh, Botanic Research Institute of Texas, right? And when we did, we turned over a lot of infrastructure to them that was already aged, that was beyond its useful life and really need to be replaced. As a part of that management contract, they're obviously gonna take care of everything from, this, from the time forward of the contract. This is our way of going back and, and rehabilitating or giving some money to rehabilitate some of those, those facilities that had undergone deferred maintenance and actually needed to be replaced. So we committed under that contract at least to put forward for future bonds funding to help replace some of those facilities. But again, once it's in place, it's theirs to manage going forward. And that's $4.6 million. Heritage and Paddock Parks renovation, this is really on the, uh, the north end of the downtown. Uh, you know, Heritage Park, for all past purposes, is closed. It really needs to be rehabilitated, and there's been a lot of effort to, to rehabilitate that. We're also going to take that opportunity, not only do that, but also do Paddock Park renovation at the same time, which is really across the street, and improve some pedestrian tra uh, transportation in that corridor. You know, as that convergence is right there, it could get very dangerous. So this is $13.5 million project, but we also have $8.3 million of private funding that would go on top of that. Fort Worth Water Gardens, 1971, I think it was uh, put in place. We've done as well as we can do with maintenance over the years and, and management of that, but it's aging. And you can tell in the plumbing is mostly where we're seeing the aging. We got a lot of bald cypress out there that those root systems have found their way to the plumbing and it has degraded some of that. We need to come back in and replace some of that. So this is taking six and a half million dollars and really rehabilitating that. Drainage and erosion control and pond dredging. You know, as I mentioned, we really would like to handle a lot of maintenance items with our PAYGO funding, right? That's six and a half cents. But a lot of these are, they're beyond that. They really need to be replaced, whether it's a dam or coming back in and completely dredging out a uh, a pond, for instance, that more, more or less operates for stormwater capacity. So as that thing silts up, we have less capacity. So it actually improves drainage. And these are the location of those parks, and all that is on the, the list that we provided as well. Meadowbrook Golf Course Renovation. You know, much like we did Rockwood, where we first started out and, and trying to improve play of the golf course, we're coming back in and rehabilitating the tees, rehabilitating the fairways, kind of addressing some drainage issues that are out there as well, improving playability. Uh, that's what that $7 million is being proposed for. Sycamore Park, Sycamore Golf, this used to be Sycamore Golf Course, about 66 acres. We've decommissioned it as a golf course, public golf course. Now we're asking to come back and, and 
develop it as a community park. So that $5 million would go to that effort. So some of the things that you would definitely see in a community park, right, like trails and park roads and picnic facilities and security lighting, again, turn it into an actual park. Stop six, enhanced neighborhood family aquatics facility. So what we're proposing is an enhanced neighborhood aquatics facility at $7 million that will be located next to the Stop Six community hub. And I'll explain what that project is, but for reference purposes, this aquatics facility would be paired with that project and located adjacent to it in the Stop Six area across from Rosedale Park. Forest Park pool replacement. Obviously, it's, it's undergone its fair share of rehabilitation over the years, but it needs to be replaced. Now, it is being designed as an enhanced neighborhood aquatics facility, okay? Um, seven and a half million dollars. Parks Department <clears throat> was also given $900,000 in advance of the bond program to start the early design of the facility, and that's what they're doing today. So the hope is by the time we get to the 2022 bomb program, we'll at least have the design in place for the, uh, for the new. Yes, ma'am. Well, is Forest Park going to be another pool for uh, where everybody's going to swim at like it is now? It, it's a, it'll be a public pool, yes, ma'am. Public pool? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Echo Lake Park Improvements. So we got this from the county in 2017. It's about 41 acres, and it's located just on the north side of Worth Heights Community Center. Now, the county, when they gave it to us, gave it to us with a lot of infrastructure that was in poor condition, right? The ball fields were deteriorating, right? None, none, nothing in there was ADA compliant, right? You had all the playgrounds that are deteriorated. What we're going to do is come back in and rehabilitate that at a, at a cost of about $5 million. Now, they did give us the property. Um, but we think we can do a great job with it and integrate it with uh, Worth Heights. Uh, Gateway Park Development, this is $8 million for design and construction of additional park improvements and athletic fields and skate park and parking lots and security lighting at Gateway. Neighborhood Park Improvements, so these are neighborhood parks or properties that we had acquired as park reserve, if you will, for future, redevelop for future development. So, this is the list of parks here, and it'll be our typical neighborhood park. We'll develop it with uh, playgrounds and shelters and walking and bike trails and picnic facilities and all the site furnishings that you would see associated with our neighborhood parks. Fort Worth Zoo. So we have a contract with Fort Worth Zoo, Fort Worth Zoological Society, right, to provide the infrastructure necessar necessary to support their new exhibits, okay? So we have a contractual obligation. This three and a half million dollars is to do just that. When they have a new exhibit, we're gonna put the water and sewer and those things in that help support the exhibit. It's a pretty good return when you look at the value of the exhibits they're putting in place versus what you know, we're asking for in terms of the infrastructure necessary to support it. Trail gap connections. So these are the three areas that we're most concerned with. So the five and a half million dollars, I think Bomber Spur is in this particular area. So we're looking to do is, is close those, those gaps in the trail sections. So this five and a half million, and we'll try to leverage as much of these dollars with Texas Parks and Wildlife or someone else that might have grant funding available to assist with that project. Open space conservation. I mentioned this a little earlier that this is a new category. What we're trying to do is preser ecosystem preservation and open space. Because if we don't, it's going to evaporate. It's going to be taken in for development. It's going to be put into another use. And really, to have more livable communities and, and ecosystem preservation, we're suggesting $15 million to go out on a prioritized basis and acquire those high quality ecosystem for preservation. We started this actually as a project maybe a couple years ago with our first acquisition on Prodgast Hill that we acquired from one of the gas to gas producers. Yes, ma'am. I just had a question about the open space. I, this is critical that we do this because the more strip malls and parking lots and everything that we build and the more concrete the, heart, the rain has to go to, then you're gonna start having flooding in neighborhoods that never happened before. So we've got, it's critical to keep the open space conservation as part of part of your plan. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. 
So facility improvements, so what we'll talk about here is really the vertical components, um, community centers, public safety, and then a public library. And this is where they're located at on that. This is where they're located at in relationship to the MMAs. So here's a list of those projects. Now we've got one here in Council District 3 on Gettys at Hewland. And if you're familiar with that fire station, it's very, very small, very compact. Uh, it's supposed to operate as a three-bay double company station, but it's about half the size of a three-bay double company station. It's a little over 5,000 square feet. We typically build them at 10,000. There's so many things wrong with this, you know, other than it's aged and it shows. Um, we've actually got bay doors that do not accommodate modern fire apparatus. We have to lower the suspension on the vehicles to get them in there. That's just one of many issues with it. If we can't accommodate female firefighters in there, it's, it's very compartmentalized. If you can imagine, it's an older structure, eight out walls on the inside. It's just, it doesn't lend itself very well to any type of renovation. And it's in a small lot, if you will. So we're looking outside of, of where its location is today, but still within the service area for the fire department for an alternative site to put a more modern station out there. That's in District 3? Yes, yes, sir. I believe it's uh, 30, correct me if I'm wrong, 5933 Geddes, G-E-D-D-E-S, I think. Yeah, it's Como, is it Ulan and Geddes right there is where I, Brian Irvin, Brian Irvin, that's it, yeah. Have you found the site? Do you have a site in mind? No, ma'am, we haven't found it yet. Fire department is uh, diligently out looking in, in, in collaboration with our property management department to find a, the best location. And I guess I want to add that they want a site that's uh, community accessible, so something more than the site now just isn't as easily accessible to walk up and things like that. So they are looking for a site in that area that would be more community friendly yeah. um, since the fire stations are open 24 hours, seven days a week. And that's probably the closest fire station to you. Mm -hmm. It's probably your but the closest fire station to you. Kind of embedded in a residential area too, and I think to Valerie's point, we want to kind of pull it out of there so it, it, does, it is more accessible to the community. And then of course, our Far, no, far Northwest Library, uh, Stop 6 Hub, and then a Fire Station Community Center replacement, and then a new Northwest Patrol Division. So the Far Northwest Library, we, we have our eyes on a site uh, at Avondale, across from Sendera uh, Ranch, so it's far northwest. That was a particular area, if you looked within a three-mile radius of that general area that I just described to you. We added over 3,200 people during a pandemic year in a three-mile radius. 20,000 already out there in a three-mile radius. Yes, sir? Are they really ever going to do something to replace the Ridgely Library? Every time we have a bond issue, it's never on there. Never on there. Well, it's really out. Okay. Well, we'll I'll tell you what, we'll, because uh, these comments are good, so we'll go back to the library service and we'll, we'll determine where that sits today in facility, its, it's facility condition, when it's kind of scheduled for replacement. But we rely a lot heavily on the library and what services they need to deliver and what their highest priority needs are, but we will definitely check. Well, that's important because it serves the Como community too. And a lot of those people rely on the computers there. Yeah. Right. So I just mentioned fire station 16 at the bottom at 8.2. So included in that is land acquisition, obviously design and construction of the facility. But fire station 37, which is more in the north, uh, is on Ray Wright Road, 4721 Ray Wright Road. That fire station was intended and moved in, it's a modular building, so it was actually moved in in 1998 as a, to serve as a temporary because we had growth occurring in the north. Well, it's about time it has a permanent home. Right now it sits on Ray Wright Road, which is really a blind curve out there, so it's, it's more difficult for the firemen to deploy out of the site and get back into it. And it's about half the size of what we need for a three-bay double company station. So we'll be looking at an alternative site for it too. Community centers, I mentioned earlier the Stop 6 Hub Community Center, and really this is a replacement of the existing MLK Community Center, except it won't be at the same location. It'll be located on where Cavill Place used to be located, which was right across from Rosedale Park in the Stop 6 area. 
What we're proposing is a 28,000 square foot community center that's more multi-purpose because I mentioned project collaboration earlier. This is one where we'll have about 3,500 square feet of public library. We'll have all the recreational components that you'd see with a community center. Plus, we'll have the ability to deliver services out of there, social services programs out of the community center. Right next to it would be where we would locate the aquatics facility that I mentioned earlier. Fire Station Community Center at 11.5 is a waitlisted project from 2018. We went with Diamond Hill as a replacement community center. Still didn't, didn't do away with the need to replace the Fire Station Community Center. It really is the, an old historic fire station that's been built around and added on to over time. And it looks like that. It's very compartmentalized. It's got a second floor that's inaccessible for any programming needs because it's not ADA accessible. What we're proposing to do is remove everything except the historic fire station, preserve as much of that component as we can, and then design around it. And not do it over periods of time, let's do it all at once. There's also some acreage that surrounds that, uh, that community center that we're also going to go ahead and do some park improvements on it as well. Northwest Patrol, we already own a property at 3900 Angle Avenue, which is west of Meacham. Um, we bought that property with every intent of putting in a Northwest Patrol and consolidating their operations. Right now, they're housed on Main Street and they're housed at the, in the stockyards. We pay about $151,000 a year in lease rent for a facility we don't own so that we can liberate ourselves from that lease expense, uh, at least the fire department can, because they're taking it out of their operating side and build a new facility for them, about 32,000 square foot, so it would be able to house and consolidate those Northwest Patrol Division. So that's $18.6 million. So where we're at today. So we're in the public meeting phase, if you will. We're out seeking some input and comments. Uh, we're, we're also validating, adjusting, if we need to, some of the uh, projects that we costed out six to eight months ago. And I think it's no surprise the cost of materials have moved up, right? We've got some inflation that's in, uh, occurring, particularly in the labor market too. So we want to be able to go back and validate those costs and those assumptions that we made when we put these models together, you know, eight months to a year ago in some instances. And then, of course, we'll finalize a project list. Hopefully, by the end of the year, have something for city council after all this input to say these are the propositions and projects we want to move forward with. Be able to set that election sometime in January or February, and then of course have the election in uh, May of uh, 2022. Now, between the time we set the referendum and the actual election, we'll be coming back out and, and sharing with you each proposition that you'll be asked to consider as part of the bond program. So it doesn't end here. We're going to continually come back out and keep these things in front of you so you stay educated on everything that takes place from this day forward. So, Michelle, is this where it's located? <laughs> yes, sir. I wanted to know about the miniature train in Forest Park. We go through Trinity Park. I tried all summer to find out what happened to that. The phone number was disconnected, never saw it run. And I was afraid we were going to lose that attraction like we lost the tarantula train, okay. which is now a grapevine attraction. Uh -huh. And it has, I've seen in the past few weeks, started running again on a very limited schedule, five hours Saturday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. And who owns that? Is that part of the zoo? Does the park department, somebody, that those tracks are through a public park? Well, we just happen to have someone from parks here today. <laughs> Scott Jones, Parks and Recreation Park. Uh, it's actually a, it's a private owner and operator for the train, yeah. uh, but he does have a lease with the park department to operate the train through the, through the city. Other than that, I'm not real sure about its current operation and well, why there was a hiatus in its operation, uh, but I can get your name and number afterwards I, and I, I, can, I can make it's sure. It's just that. barely functioning. Yes. And we were down there one day, it was supposed to be open, and there were people from out of state there. And, you know, there's nothing there, no signs ever posted anything about it. Okay. And the website was incorrect, too. I, after we're through here, I'll... Website was incorrect. 
Okay, yeah. on the park and rec website, well, the, the train have material. On the train. Oh, train. So, oh, okay, I have it. But actually, the number it has is just connected. So. Excellent. I will touch base with you after okay. we we'll get there. Yes, ma'am. Can you elaborate, please, on page four sidewalks, citywide installation of sidewalks? Okay, so that's a, just a, it's a bucket list, uh, it's a bucket of money, right? Um, the TPW goes through a process to prioritize where their, their highest sidewalk needs are. So we know where some of those gaps in sidewalk connections are or where the highest priority needs are. That right now, they're working on that list, and, and I think there's some folks from TPW here that might be able to share some of that information with you after... We get done with the presentations. They get down in more detail, particularly if you're interested in a particular area of town. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. As Lorraine makes her way up to thanks, Roger. As Lorraine makes her way up to talk about the the budget, I I want to just point out some people. City Manager David Cook is here in the back. Deputy City Manager Jay Chapa is over here. Assistant City Manager Dana Bergdoff, Assistant City Manager Val Washington is here. Um, we've also got Police Chief Noakes. Where did he, is he, is he hiding in the corner back there? Police Chief Noakes is here. Chief Aldridge and Westside Commander Barthen is here too, along with some other city staff. So I appreciate y'all, just so y'all know, this is important for them to see this and be out here with us too. So uh, come on up. Good afternoon, I'm evening. I'm Lorraine Coleman, I'm budget manager with the City of Fort Worth Planning and Data Analytics Department. And I'm gonna tell you two really important things before we get started. I did a real good job matching these walls today, so <laughs> that's important. And the other thing is that my boss normally gives this presentation and he couldn't be here this evening. And so I thought I'd get some chance to practice today and I didn't, so I'm gonna walk through this data with you. And what we're gonna talk about tonight is we're gonna talk a lot about property tax and the variables and how those impact us. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about budget. We're gonna show you some slides and give you some numbers. Um, and then we're gonna talk about what's next. So, and you're gonna hope that I can do this presentation correctly. All right, so property tax values, budget, next steps. So first of all, we're gonna talk about the assessed values and the recommended tax rate. So this slide just basically shows you the growth that we've had over the last seven, eight years. And I'd like, and what you're seeing up here is the total appraised value, which is the equivalent of the market value. So if you sold your house today, what would it sell for? That's what appraised value is. The net taxable value is the next line, and that's if you own a home and you have a homestead exemption on it, that's your net taxable value. Um, and I'll call your attention to the net taxable value, those two numbers. So for 2021 fiscal year, we were at 79 billion. This year, our new value is 87 billion. And I draw your attention because we're gonna walk through that to show you how we get to those numbers. So in fiscal year 21, we had $79 billion in taxable value, net taxable value. And of that, and in 22, we have 87 billion, and we added 4.2 billion, in, which is a change in taxable value, which is a 5.3% increase in the existing value in Fort Worth. So the 79 billion increased 5.3% for everything that was existing today, or at the same time. And then we added 3.2 billion in new construction which brings us to a 9.4% increase from 21 to 22. So those increase in values, particularly the increase in existing value, has allowed us to reduce the tax rate. So we went from, a, and you heard Roger talk about this, um, 74 and three quarter cents, and we're recommending a rate of 73.25 cents this year, which is a reduction of a, a penny and a half. And the way we break this down, when we calculate taxes, and if you go out to our website and you look under the budget page and you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you're gonna see something called truth and taxation. And we've listed for you there a lot of links that you can look at for the appraisal districts, um, the counties there, there's information from the comptroller's website that you can look at. You can look at our calculations. And when you look at those calculations, we're gonna see two basic rates, which is 
operations and maintenance, or your O&M, and the debt rate. So that's what you'll see, that's what we're required by the state to calculate. Now the city for it takes it one step further because we have a commitment to pay-as-you-go capital infrastructure. So we take our operations and maintenance rate and we further reduce that, or we don't reduce it, we just split it between operations, which is your salary and benefits, contractual obligations, and capital, which we call pay-as-you-go capital. Um, and we'll have a list later in here that'll tell you what that goes for and what it pays for. So, and this is the way we break the rate down. So it's about an 80-20 split between operations and maintenance and debt. So, and that we, we, you'll see it as we go further on, we sort of maintain that split as we go. Now, this is just a historical, how those rates have looked over since 2013. And you can see beginning in 2016 that we began, or 2017, we began to reduce our rates as values grew. It allowed us to reduce our tax rate at the same time. So you'll see that we've gone from 85 and a half cents in 2016 to the current 73.25 cents that's recommended for this year for 22. The bottom portion of it just shows you the percentage of our tax rate that goes towards debt and to the PAYGO. And you can see that we've maintained around 29 to 30% year over year when you look at the, this line here. So important variables are the value, the rate, and the revenue. So we take our taxable value, and that's what we use to calculate levy and revenue on. And we multiply it by the tax rate to come up with the revenue that you see here. So while values are up 9.4%, we've lowered the tax rate so that overall revenues are only increasing approximately 7%. And remember, for more than 4% of that is attributable to new construction. So this is just another way to look at the values that those, those rates create as far as O&M. And this is a comparison of current year to what we're proposing for 22. Um, and you see what we, what we generated last year, what we expect to generate in 21 and the variance. Um, what you'll see on here also this year is economic development. Um, and what we've done this year is taken about a quarter of a cent um, the value of a penny in tax revenue is about $8 million, so a quarter of a cent would be the $2 million. And we have set it aside for economic development. So that's something new we've done here that you see on this slide that's a little bit different. And that's to be used for um, cash economic incentives as we go forward. So this slide demonstrates how these different variables impact you. So if you had a home that was $200,000 and you had that average 5.3% increase in value that we talked about earlier, that would increase the taxable value of your house to $210,600. So that's how that increase in value impacts you. So you can see below, we've reduced the tax rate because of that increase and how that impacts you in City of Fort Worth taxes is that, you know, at the 7 to 4.75%, it was $1,400. And it, your value's grown, but even though the lowers rate, it's still a little, slightly higher at $1,500. Just rounding. So when you go back to this same chart and you want to see how this breaks down, this is what you're paying for city services given if your house was at that value. Um, you're paying the 1,543 overall, 1,200 goes to operation maintenance, which then means 1,000 or 1,100 for operations, 137 goes to capital, the infrastructure, the pay as you go, and then 311 goes to debt or INS. So now we're gonna talk about the recommended budget for FY22. So right now the budget is a total of $1.8 billion. As you can see, the majority of that is for the general fund, which has 
contains the public safety, your parks, your libraries, your code. Um, our administrative services are also included in that. We also have enterprise funds, your water, your sewer, solid waste, storm water. We have special revenue funds like the CCPD. Um, culture and tourism are included there. We have internal service funds that service internally the city, our fleet services, our, our health risk account um, fund. We have debt service and then fiduciary funds. So looking more granularly at the general fund, um, when you look at revenues, you can see that basically 80% of our revenues for the general fund are generated through taxes, property tax and sales tax. The remainder are through um, you know, charges for services, license for permits, we do transfers between departments for services, fines and forfeitures, those take up the other eight, 20%. Could, could you go back to okay, back to for this? Okay, you have a, a budget of one point eight billion dollars. Yes. And you have revenues of seven hundred and ninety-six million. So the one point eight billion is for all funds citywide. It's not just this general fund. So this is our total operating budget. It includes all funds. There's a billion dollar difference there. This, this is just the general fund. So you can't see it. So this is 761 million. Just, just this fund by itself is the 761 million, which matches the revenue on this one. Smoke and mirrors. Okay, see, my boss put this together, so I'm just saying. <laughs> um, so yes, and these are the general fund revenues. We, we talked about that, and you made me go back to. Um, and then this is just a comparison of those, those same revenues from this year to what we're proposing for next year, and the dollar amount of change and the percentage change, and if you Remember, if you signed up outside, you will all get a copy of this presentation, too, so. And then this chart is all the departments that are within the general fund. And this has their budget, current year, versus what we're proposing for 22 and the variance. Um, we go from high to lows. So you'll see the police department, the fire department, Park and recreation, transportation, those are our top four dollar wise. What's the non departmental? Non departmental is a is a budget that we use for all those things that we can't directly put in another department. Um, one of those being separation pay. When people leave the city, um, they sometimes have vacation on the books or that they get paid out for. So rather than putting big chunks of money in, in departmental budgets, we will hold it in a contingency fund in non-departmental. Um, and part of that also is, is, I believe, for the new city hall costs. We place money there because it didn't belong in anybody else's budget, so we put it in non-departmental. Yes, ma'am. What was the budget for code and finance? Is that, where does that fall in there? It's a book library. Yes. Library is 22. You know, we're kind of in the middle. Yeah. It went from 24 million to 25.6, which was a 6.8% increase. And how long has that diversity and inclusion line item. It's at the bottom of the um, That department has, been, I think it's, this is the third year for the diversity inclusion department. Anybody raise your hand if, if I'm wrong on that one. I think it is the third year. So. So it was created up, it was created out of the race and culture task force. And they basically took pieces of other departments. So the Human Relations Commission, which is 
who is part of the communications department that's existed in Fort Worth since the uh, 1980s or so, that uh, take care of like EEOC complaints on housing or uh, in discrimination claims, that kind of thing. That was moved to this department. Also, our MBD office, which is a minority business enterprise office that was part of economic development, was moved to this de department. So it was a new department to try to focus on diversity and inclusion efforts overall in the city. So they're working with every, every department to come up with an overall plan. Uh, so it includes, it's kind of a comp compilation of different groups that we put together. We, we hired a new director to really fund the department. I mean, one person was brought together here. Thank you. Um, yes. On that budget entry that you have for code compliance, does that include hiring additional people for that department? Or is that just a budget to get for what already exists? <coughs> I believe there's is a budget for what currently, ex I mean, it, it's maintaining current services plus, but. Uh, there are no new employees in the code budget um, in the fiscal year 22 budget, but that does include some contractual increases. Um, and I'd be glad to walk you through the specifics of the code budget and um, to give you exactly where the variances lie from fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 22. But it doesn't include increasing your staff at all? No, it doesn't in the code's general fund budget. Um, I will tell you, code is working with the marshals division to utilize them to help with the legal dumping and enforcement efforts. So we are going to use um, marshals to help with those efforts, but their fiscal year 22 budget does not include the addition of new staff. Would it be okay if I got your number before I leave? Yes. So, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. Yes, what is diversity and inclusion in the department? Okay. Yes. 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 Y
foundation. Comments noted. Um, I know that we, as a city, we have taken some actions to um, improve the situation with um, the pension. I know right now we're looking at refreshing our actuarial studies to see where we are, to confirm where we are now. So, uh, well, you know where you are. You're 500 million short. <laughs> <laughs> so two years ago, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Hey, thanks for the question. And uh, you might be reading some of the financial statements. The the plan is actually amortized over forty two years, so it is paid off at a certain point in time. The budget that's actually before this year. Uh, includes more money from taxpayers for the pension. That's not a positive thing to hear, but the budget includes another 1.2% of all payroll to go to the pension. Also includes a 0.8% from all employees to go into the pension. If we don't improve the amortization to 30 years, then it'll, that'll happen again next year. And we'll put another 1.2% of payroll from taxpayers and we'll another 0.8% from employees. If we still don't hit 30-year amortization at that point in time, then we'll be reevaluating where we are with the pension. That might, again, mean more contributions from the tax. Let me finish. That might be more contributions, again, from the taxpayer, changes to the benefit, more money from employees, or a combination of all three. Well, look, we got into this situation under the regime of Mr. Moncrief and Ms. Price. And I hope Ms. Parker can do better. Yes, sir. I got a question about the general fund. Uh, reference to the $18 million lawsuit the city of Fort Worth needs to pay back to the state. I'm a citizen on patrol member of Westside Fort Worth. And Mayor Betsy Flies made a comment to the news media in, in reference to the $18 million lawsuit, said that the City of Fort Worth General Fund and CCPD could face cutbacks for years to come. That also was repeated by the new Mayor, uh, Mary Parker, and the new City Council. Uh, how is that going to affect the, the Police Department and the CCPD program, which funds our citizen on the 12th? That's a very good question. And you can't, I know. <laughs> We're saying no, we can <laughs> That's a tough question, I know. So I, I believe when we found out, so basically what happened is that a large, very large taxpayer that does business with the federal government paid $18 million in sales taxes over a period of time that they shouldn't have paid. The federal government is tax exempt. They sued the state. The state settled. The city has no control of what the state settled or not settled. And so the city, in essence, received they, the, the state paid back a portion for that they received on their sales tax. The city has to pay back approximately $18 million, $12 million from the general fund, $6 million from CCPD because of the one cent sales tax and the half cent sales tax uh, to the state because the state paid the whole thing back. We've set up a program to pay it back over a period of, was it 14 years? I think it was 12 years. So to minimize the impact so that we didn't, so we could stretch out that payment over time. And I think when those comments were made, we were in the middle of COVID and sales tax revenues were way down. What's happened is that's actually turned around. And so we don't see, since we're budgeting for that to occur over a 12 year period, we flattened out any kind of impact and we shouldn't see any impact to, um, negative impact to the CCPD fund or the general fund and, and to Code Blue specifically. All right. They are both much more eloquent than me when the, for those tough questions. So um, we get to move on. This is uh, represents some of the drivers that impact the general fund for the increases this year. As you can see, pension contribution is 
first thing on there. We also have um, obligations with collective bargaining for the fire department, meet and confer with the police department that we have to fund. Um, opening new facilities accounts for some of that because we have to pay for the operations of those new facilities. We increase pay for performance and of course we had some development incentives as well. So moving to the next group of um, funds, the enterprise funds, which again are your water, your sewer, your solid waste, storm water. In total, there's 631 million. 78% of that is from the water and sewer fund. And the main thing about the enterprise funds is that there's no retail water sewer rate increases, no residential solid waste fee increases, no stormwater user fee increases this year, no parking rate increases this year either. That's a good thing. Um, then we come to the next group, which is special revenue funds, and you'll see CCPD up here is the major one funded through sales tax. We also have the culture and tourism. In total, they're $173 million. The majority, these are all self-supporting funds, so. Did you say sales tax? CCPD is supported through sales tax. I didn't think we had a sales tax. Oh, I'm sorry, I was making a statement. And then this is the recommended CIP. This is just representative of we do every year when we do the operating budget, we also do um, a five-year capital improvement plan program. So for 2022, you can see that we're investing $442 million into capital. And then we talked earlier about a portion of the O&M rate operation and maintenance goes to PAYGO capital. And this year there was a four million dollar increase in that pago capital and what it, that goes towards is as you can see here street maintenance traffic system maintenance neighborhood improvement strategy park maintenance bridge maintenance sidewalks and street lighting so those are how those dollars are invested annually and this was again boss did this one um this was a per capita look at what our new population from the 2020 census is 918,000. And so when looking at that, looking at 2021, what we generated in, so there's that, and I believe this is the last one. Oh, no next steps. So the next steps are, we have several more of these town hall meetings. There'll be a, a list of where these are located. There is a budget work session on September 10th, which is Friday, begins at 9.30. I encourage you all to log on and watch. Um, on September 14th, there will be a public hearing for both the budget and the tax rate. And then those will, with their planned adoption for both of those things is on September 21st. And then there's a list of the town hall meetings. Ooh, and, oops. and that is it. So any other questions? Yes, sir. Will there be any more town halls or is that the other one there? Um, this is the list that I have, so yes. Rel related to the budget, so. Yes, ma'am. Um, is anybody going to talk about the public improvement uh, uh, development tax that that's going to be the PID 21? The Las Vegas Trail. Now, in, what was your question? My question is, what the money is going to be spent on specifically? Why there's a fifty-seven thousand dollar contribution to fund balance charge, which doesn't really make sense to me. But none of the other PIDs have that charge. I think all the pits have a contribution to fund charge. Yeah. yeah. Not spelled out in the paper. In which? Paper. Uh, it's a, a it, telegram when they came out with it. I can tell you overall it's about $300,000, this new PID. As we talked about earlier, I think before you arrived, the Las Vegas Trail initiative. Oh, did you is, talk about it? I, well, I talked about Las Vegas Trail and all the crime and everything there. So we put this PID, and it does not tax the homeowners, it taxes the apartments and everything else there. The homeowners have been cut out in some of the businesses. 
With this 300,000, that'll give us about um, 150 that will go to, for public safety, so we can have some more officers down there, off duty, et cetera, working the area. Um, another portion goes to uh, um, beautification, but that's mostly going to be trash abatement in that area. And then another portion is for increased activities at the community center itself. And the contribution to fund balance is funds, it's an assessment like a tax, but it's an assessment. They don't come in until January. The fiscal year starts in October. So you need to build a three month fund balance so that the following year they can start operating to have dollars in those months. So that's why there's a contribution to fund balance that provides every year you have that amount so you can start that year with funds before you actually collect the dollars. So every every, every new setup, basically does the setup has a, a fund balance, running fund balance to be able to do that so they have all 12 months because the funds come in three, four months later. Well, I always thought it was for the residential people who too. Yeah, no, no, no. We, we carved all, do you live over, the, yeah, we carved all the homes out. It's the apartments and the commercial properties that are being taxed. Good job. Yeah, Thank you. you're I mean, yeah, I can talk to you about that. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question, and I've talked to Michael about this, and I understand it. The doesn't have anything to do with the city of Fort Worth, but the trash in this city is ridiculous. <laughs> and so text God, are they yeah. who we contact? Because they are not doing their job, Katie. I talked to you and y'all were nice enough to get back to me three or four times. Just a little section from Camp Bowie and Horn going east to Rosedale. Oh my gosh. It's, horrible. Horrible. it's disgusting. So who do you suggest we call? Because Maddie Parker will not pick up her phone. Call, her phone, and she still has the stu same stupid recording on it. <laughs> so I'm tired of messing trying to get with her. So do we contact text? Text. Who do we contact? The office of the district engineer is what I Office of district engineer, <laughs> and where or would that be? They're, they're, all, they're physically located over on Park and Twenty, but his office is the one that runs the whole district. Whenever y'all complain to us, we in, in no, the sections I, that aren't the city, we do pass it on. I but, understand, yeah. and you did, and I appreciate that. But no, nobody did anything about it, and that's not your responsibility. That I want to know who's it is. So. They don't. They don't enjoy citizens' call. I don't care. You know, that's why it would work. <laughs> <laughs> so it's called the what? He's the district engineer for TxDOT for this area. I would also say you have a state rep and a state senator that do TxDOT's budget every year, okay. and or every two years. So you might give them a call and let them know you're. Dissatisfaction. Well, it's not just me. I think the whole city is disgusting. I agree with you. Yeah. Get some people to keep their hand, their garbage in their cars instead of throwing it out the window. No, I also want to throw it Anybody? Anybody? I do have one more question about the debt, the huge deficit with the city. And is that going to be addressed through property taxes or? <laughs> please come back. <laughs> This is David Cook, the city manager. So he's David, can't you just write a check? Hey. Yeah, but then I'll have to ask you for the money. So, so let me offer this, I th and we have these on our website, and that is the ratings from the rating agencies that rate all local governments. And the city has a double A plus credit rating. So when we we don't have a triple A. But we have a double A plus, which is still a strong rating for local governments. Our debt burden is evaluated in a number of different ways. One is, are we a growing uh, community with growing assessed values? And yes, you, yes, we are. So the way we're rated by rating agencies, I'd encourage you to look at that. That's how they're gonna rate local governments. And one of the expectations of rating agencies, if you have a growing community, is you're investing in infrastructure for a growing community, which is the 2022 bond program that Roger talked about earlier. And so if we weren't investing in infrastructure, that's a way that rating agencies then look at us as not meeting our obligations for a growing community and then we're in actually in a more problematic way. Carrying debt is not always a negative when you're financing infrastructure that's gonna be used by the next generation. So these roads that we build are gonna last 20 years. The water and sewer we put in the ground is gonna last 30 years. 
the parks are going to last indefinitely except for the ongoing maintenance that goes along. So there's a lot of reasons of using debt to finance public infrastructure, and it's rated favorably by independent rating agencies that review all local governments. Okay, I don't care about the ratings. Okay. I want to know yeah. how it's going to be paid back. How, how are we paying it back with our, with our property taxes? Yes. So when you saw that portion of the property tax rate that goes to debt, right, that Roger talked about, that is still able to come down over time if we continue to grow at the assessed value that you've seen over the last couple decades, that debt can be paid back without an increase in the property tax rate. In fact, the property tax rate has come down, as it has been pointed out on a couple slides, and part of that is the amount that goes to pay the debt. That's all you had to say. <laughs> it, it's a shell game. The property tax goes down. Values go up. Yes, they do. Values go up. So, you know, do we have a, an estimate of the amount of property tax that we have to pay in the unrestricted deficit for 22? I'm sorry? The unrestricted deficit for 22. We have an estimate of it. I can, we can, I see you have pages from the financial statements. I'll be glad to spend time with you after and, and describe those. My personal property tax hasn't gone down at all. It went up 14 percent. I didn't say your property tax, the revenues that you pay has gone down. The property, no, no, no. Values are going up. Property tax rates, we try to bring those down. It's not always going to offset the increase in assessed value. I think also mentioning it's not just the city that taxes too. That's correct. We're, we make up about a quarter of the tax bill. <laughs> it includes. So my property tax has gone up every year, and last year it hit 14%. You only get a quarter of that? We get a quarter of the total tax bill. Yeah, yeah. For Jack, yeah. Yes. 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 They Jack they like for the They um, didn't have school for the money. <laughs> Second question. <laughs> it was a budget. It was a slim margin, but if you go back and look, they raised their tax rate like 12 cents. So they they offset the things we did, and, and the county did to, to minimize their tax rate was offset by the increase in the school tax rate. Really? Yes. Can you rescind that? So last year, if your taxes went up, we continued to, to bring our rate down. The county brought theirs down, but the school district had a proposition in the November elections to raise their tax rate. And I believe they raised it like 12 cents. If you go back and look, they had an ad all these things that they were doing, but so they sort of took advantage of the fact that we were all lowering our rates and they increased theirs and it looked like it minimized what you're, but go back and look, it's your school tax. And I'll tell you this, if you go to, again, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, go to the budget page on, our, on the city's website, scroll to the bottom and you're gonna see truth and taxation. And you're gonna see some websites for the um, counties. Now we have four counties, so just go to Tarrant. But there's a website there where, they're, where they will include all the tax rate for, for your taxes. You put in your address and it's gonna pull up all the tax rates. And you'll see what the schools did, what the county did, the hospital district, the water district, and you can look back. You can look back over several years and you can see whose rates went up, who changed, and who, who didn't. So it's, it, it's was a requirement in the 2019 legislature that we do that website. I would encourage you to go look. If you have questions about it, you can email questions about your taxes to taxes, T-A-X-E-S, at fortworthtexas.gov. You said taxes, why not? Taxes. Taxes, and, that, and that, that address is on that page too if you go look at it. So there's a lot of useful information there's a lot of forms, and it's kind of overwhelming, but. And the school bond this year they're proposing is $1.2 billion with a B. So we need everybody we need to, to say that. no.
Well, you need to make sure that you're informed about what they're asking for. And that is the thing that, that's important is what are they asking for and what are they trying to do with it? So I'm just saying. <laughs> no. And if you look in our budget book, there's a chart that shows you what percentage everybody is. <laughs> so we, we, we try to be a little more. And I'll say the reason we had this is so you know when we're putting the FY 2022 bond, you know what all those projects are and where the money's going. So I will pass this forward to yeah. I got a question about the market value and uh, sales price of the home situation or uh, property taxes up as a homeowner. I've been hearing that a lot of, a lot of people sell their houses for five, ten thousand over appraised value, market value, just to sell their homes. And we get a lot of out of state investors from California and other states buying up the, the, our houses and they and they don't care how much they spend for how they'll spend twenty thousand over the market value just to get the house. So that problem with that is that raises all the rest of the homeowners' property taxes up. All the tax rates not going up. Our market value of pay, uh, uh, market and sales value is going up, which causes us to pay more taxes each year. Is the city doing anything to to force these cut back on these out state investors raising our market value on our on homes in our neighborhood? There's, yeah, I think it's no. Yeah, it's your private property. It's supply and demand. Do you want to sell it for twenty thousand or thirty thousand? Yeah, that's the market. But I would encourage you to protest your property values. Well, you know, a little bit, because I have the same issue you do. I, I, it, mine keep going up, yeah, but I, I would still do it anyways. They said to me, uh, I've been fighting for years. I have them come out, I asked them to send a person out because I had my square footage wrong. They said I had a three car garage, I have a one car garage. They, so so he said, okay, you're right. He remeasured my house. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, but one car garage. And I said, well, I, all right, I need to make these changes. How do I do that? And you know what he told me? It's the IRS tax code you have to go through. I hung, and I have his car to this day. And I, they said, I, I have called them a million times and said, what the heck is this? And she goes, that is not right. I said, no, no, no. So you cannot deal with the Karen Appraisal District at all. So Again, there. If you go to the website that I referred you to, there. Yeah, that's the only way you can do. Well, and then if you use the taxes at Fort Worth, Texas.gov. Um, no, I just uh, put my own value on there anyway. But so. I'm just innovative that no, but they're horrible. Those people are horrible. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank y'all for coming out. We'll stick around and answer questions if y'all have any. But yeah, I appreciate all that.